Hello, I'm Brian Callanan. What's a poverty defense for misdemeanor crime? And how would that affect our legal system? Will a new zoning change for affordable housing make an impact on our homelessness crisis? And what's behind the council's latest vote to cut funding for the Seattle Police Department? Council members Lisa Herbold and Andrew Lewis answer these questions and the ones you're sending in too, next on Council Edition. It's not decriminalizing crime. There's a lot of things that it, it has been said that it is, that it is not. Seattle's been a trailblazer and a leader on permanent supportive housing, but we haven't been doing it to scale. All that and more coming up next on City Inside Out, Council Edition. It is great to be joined by Councilmember Lisa Herbold from District 1 from West Seattle down to South Park and Councilmember Andrew J. Lewis from District 7 from downtown to Magnolia. Thank you both for joining me here. I want to jump right to it. And Councilmember Lewis, I'll start with you here. I'm looking at your role as chair of the Council's Committee on Homelessness. And as we're recording the show, basically, Seattle Police and other authorities have gone through an attempt to try to sweep Cal Anderson Park, where a large homeless encampment has been set up for the past several months. The CDC's advice, as we all know during the pandemic is, let people shelter in place. But the people who live around Cal Anderson have been saying this is getting out of control. Now we're seeing barricades from the protesters again. So what is next for Cal Anderson and other parks? We actually got a viewer email in on this too. Eric writes, while I understand that during COVID-19, this situation has been allowed to develop, is there also going to be a point where you try to end camping in our public parks? And if so, when will that be? Councilmember Lewis. Well, I think we need to start by centering what all of us can agree on, and that is that parks are a place for recreation, for quiet contemplation, uh, for the use of all of our neighbors, uh, but for those purposes and not for uh, a permanent place to live or a semi-permanent place to live. And I think we need to start from that point uh, that acknowledges that the presence of the tents and the encampments in our parks is a reflection um, of the combined effects of the recession of COVID-19, uh, and then it is temporary. This is not going to be a permanent ongoing thing. Uh, my biggest priority during the budget process was standing up additional transitional shelter spaces, which we know people living unhoused uh, will accept if they're offered. Uh, and we know that we have a complete dearth of supply relative to the demand. Uh, and the council did that. Uh, we approved 300 uh, um, spaces for hotel rooms. We approved 125 enhanced shelter spaces. Uh, we approved 120 tiny house uh, shelter spaces on top of our existing transitional shelter capacity. Yep. Uh, that is gonna make a difference and I'm glad okay. that's in there. Uh, and uh, you know, I think our first focus needs to be how we can get resources like that to folks that are living in yeah. parts so that we can reclaim parks for their intended purpose, which is not for shelter. Yeah, and uh, I just wanna make sure I dive a little further into this, Council Member Herbold here. Your, re your response to this, what's happening at Cal Anderson Park, it's been cleared out actually a number of times over the past few months here. People keep coming back. Now we're seeing this barricade situation again, like we saw with the Chaz and the Chop this past summer. Your concerns about what's happening at Cal Anderson, where do we go from here? Do we wanna see a repeat of Chop or your, your thoughts about what's gonna happen there? Yeah, um, I think what's going on in Cal Anderson um, is is different than um, what we see um, with unsheltered homelessness in some, in some of our parks. Mm -hmm. It was described to me yesterday, um, I think very accurately, as a complex ecosystem because it is not just the um, the folks who are living unsheltered who are staying in the park, but that it's also a location uh, for political organizing and protest and a and a gathering place. Mm -hmm. um, and so some of the folks um, who are involved in that political protest have been um, also occupying the park. Um, and the fact that there are people who are living unhomeless in the park allows for that in some ways that occupation to continue. Mm -hmm. And the city parks department ha made, has made a, distingu a distinction between how they are treating this encampment um, and encampments in other parks. And they sent out notices um, 
yesterday to people who yeah. have been contacting council members. And uh, typically when people contact council members, we ask for assistance from our departments and sure. in getting back to folks with response. And they were very clear that the moratorium again uh, of moving um, encampments of homeless people in parks is going to continue yeah. um, in other parks, but they are treating what's going on um, at Cal Anderson differently. Hmm. Does, does that mean they will get moved out of there or what's your expectation about what's going to happen at Cal Anderson? Uh, they, as, as from what I understand, they are moving forward um, mm. with the encampment removal okay. Um, okay. And, and treating it differently than the existing moratorium um, against encampment removals of okay. uh, unsheltered homeless people because of the CDC recommendation yeah. um, in, in, in light of COVID-19 concerns around transmission. Got it. Uh, uh, Councilmember Lewis, any final thoughts about this before we move on? Uh, no, I think Lisa covered it great. Okay. All right. I know there's a lot still ahead with that, so we've, we've got something to cover here. But uh, Councilmember Lewis, I do want to stick with you and look a little bit longer range here. You're sponsoring an ordinance to establish a new zoning code so the city can fast track building new permanent supportive housing. How's that going to help the city? When might we, might we see an impact from it? We got on a question via Facebook here. Why is it taking the city so long to make progress on homelessness? What's the return on investment on the money the city has invested to combat this problem over the past decade? Thank you for the question coming in. Uh, Councilmember Lewis, your response, and please talk about your ordinance too. Yeah, Brian, I, I think the really frustrating thing is we do know um, what to do uh, about homelessness writ large, and that is something we're actually very good at in the city of Seattle, which is permanent supportive housing. Uh, Seattle's been a trailblazer and a leader on permanent supportive housing, but we haven't been doing it to scale, uh, the scale of the demand uh, of the number of our neighbors experiencing homelessness. Just as a really brief bit of background um, for your viewers, permanent supportive housing is the combination of, uh, of a housing option. Uh, so like a, a single room occupancy apartment typically mm -hmm. with on-site services um, to help folks uh, who might have uh, some kind of public health reason uh, that they've been homeless, uh, like mental, um, uh, an, an undiagnosed mental health condition yeah. uh, or some kind of substance addiction. Mm -hmm. uh, so it merges those two things together, treatment and housing at the same time. Yeah. Very effective model uh, that a lot of great local providers have been leaders in. Uh, DESC, uh, Plymouth Housing, Chief Seattle Club, to, to cite a couple of examples. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the problems, Brian, is permanent supportive housing is very different from other types of housing, very different yeah. from the housing that you or I live in. Uh, it's typically multifamily housing, uh, but the folks that live in it don't necessarily need um, a lot of the amenities that we require uh, otherwise situated commercial um, housing to have. I mean, a good okay. example of this is bike storage. Uh, there's a lot of folks in permanent supportive housing who have um, uh, disabilities that make it difficult um, to use bikes as a mobility um, strategy. Okay. Uh, and typically that is underutilized. Um, that has big costs uh, for permanent supportive housing developers to put that in there, and it takes away space um, that could be additional housing units. Uh, there are also other restrictions around um, uh, design review and other processes uh, that make it take a lot longer to site, develop, and build those, those houses. Um, okay. In the case of Plymouth Housing, um, they could build uh, um, some of their developments four to six months faster mm -hmm. if they didn't have to go through the design review um, process. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of things in that bill, but this is it's cutting the red tape. Yeah. Um, it could save about $70,000 per unit in the okay. construction of new permanent supportive housing. Uh, and this is really uh, what we need to do to fast track this and to save money uh, in getting more of our neighbors experiencing homelessness inside faster and cheaper. Okay. And Council Member Herbold, I want your thoughts on this zoning ordinance, please. And if you could respond to another email we got in, uh, Eric sent this one in too. He actually wants to build an accessory dwelling unit, a backyard cottage. He actually asked the city if there were any incentives to build it as affordable housing. Planning and development told him no. So he's asking this. Instead of treating homeowners as an obstacle to be removed to make way for affordable housing, why doesn't the city try working with homeowners to add affordable housing? And thank you very much for the question, Eric. Councilmember Herbold, a zoning ordinance to build permanent supportive housing, I know raises a lot of concerns in a city that's dominated by single family housing. Your response to Eric's criticism and some thoughts about this new ordinance too. Well, it's my understanding, um, and Councilmember Lewis, please, uh, I invite you to correct me if I'm wrong. This isn't a new zoning ordinance. This is a definitional change um, to allow um, uh, the 
allow permit supportive housing to be built more quickly in the places that it already can be built. Mm -hmm. yeah. So for, for folks who are concerned about multifamily housing coming to neighborhoods where multifamily housing isn't currently allowed, this would not change that. This, this ordinance would exempt from design review permit supportive housing as long as they are able to establish that they're meeting the income thresholds for the affordable units and it would exempt um, permit supportive housing from doing some things like for instance as Councilmember Lewis mentioned um, including uh, bike storage facilities right um, um, so it's not it's not new zoning right. um, I just I just uh, I mean, I, I think we should look at more places to build multifamily uh, affordable housing, but I, uh, I don't want to give the wrong impression that that's what this is. Okay. Okay. Um, is but, it something uh, you want to see in District 1, that type of a thing? Your, oh, my your thoughts about, yeah, yes. let's talk about it. Absolutely. Um, there is a coalition of neighborhood groups in District 1 called uh, D1 Community Network, and they um, are, represent both uh, West Seattle neighborhoods as well as South Park, and mm -hmm. they have been working... Uh, toward the goal of attracting more affordable housing development into um, District 1. We, mm -hmm. we have um, a, a real um, dearth of um, available affordable housing. It's not getting built at the same rate as in some other neighborhoods. And so they've actually had meetings where they've invited um, uh, low-income housing developers to come in and ask how we can partner to work together to build more affordable housing. So I'm really excited about that partnership. Okay. But um, one of the one of the barriers is is always cost of land. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I, I think items uh, and initiatives such as um, what Council Member Lewis is proposing can mm -hmm. help drive down um, the cost of development even with land costs still being high, that can mm -hmm. attract um, more opportunities and more engagement from our from our nonprofit community to do more okay. this work. Okay, thanks for covering all that. I want to switch gears if I could, and Councilmember Herbold, I'll stay with you here. I want to talk about the so-called poverty defense the council is discussing right now. It's part of your work as chair of the Public Safety Committee. I believe the goal of this is to put into city code something Seattle has been doing for a while in practice, which is trying to stop people who commit crimes of poverty shoplifting so they can eat, etc., from getting caught up in the justice system. But it can be difficult to explain that nuance when we see so much international coverage on this even. So many voices saying this soft on crime. What about the store owners, the crime victims? How do you respond to these criticisms? How do you try to change the narrative here? Well, um, first of all, I, I just want to be clear that this uh, ordinance itself would not um, stop anybody from being involved in the criminal justice system. It is. It, it would be a defense that somebody could use after they are arrested, after um, a, a, a prosecutor decided to prosecute them. An affirmative so, defense. So right. mm -hmm. th th this individual um, who would use this defense would already have uh, be in the criminal justice system. All this would allow somebody to do would be to assert that and and, and um, you know the issue of burden of proof is is one of those issues that we're that we're discussing, mm -hmm. but there would be a burden of proof to um, to demonstrate that there was no reasonable alternative if somebody, for instance, was trespassing to get shelter or mm -hmm. stole a sandwich um, to because they were hungry and there wasn't a nearby food bank open. Mm -hmm. um, they would assert that defense, but the decision about guilt will still as it always is, be in the hands of either the judge or the jury. Mm -hmm. um, and so the goal of this is just to be, um, uh, to allow a defendant um, to be more transparent um, with the decision makers around justice um, about what the underlying, um, uh, the underlying circumstances were that, that led to them, to them breaking a law. Yeah. Um, I just want to be also uh, really clear that it's it is not um, making misdemeanors legal. It's not decriminalizing crime. There's a lot of things that it, it has been said that it is that it is not. Mm -hmm. um, and I just also want to say um, I don't have legislation developed yet. Um, right. There was a a model bill that was developed by the uh, public defenders mm -hmm. in coalition 
with um, an organization called Decriminalize uh, Seattle and King County Equity Now that represents um, more than 300 community groups. Yeah. Um, that was a proposal that they made. And in response to some of what I've heard from people um, um, about that proposal, um, that has helped guide the conversations that I've begun to have in my committee. Okay. Um, and so when um, when I met about this last week in committee, it was mm -hmm. specifically structured to address some of the concerns from the public that we've right. already heard, such as should we limit the use of the defense to particular types of misdemeanors right. and make sure that other types of misdemeanors aren't eligible? Should we make sure that the defense can't be used in instances where people are stealing uh, from a store, for instance, to then fence those goods, even if they're doing so in order to pay their rent? So, um, you know, this is, uh, we're early days in, in discussing this proposal and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm listening to the feedback of the community. But what is clear to me is our current system is not working. And, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit ironic to me that um, folks that who, that led to the development of, for instance, the prolific offenders um, uh, mm -hmm. list critiquing the fact that the current system does not work um, has suggested that we shouldn't have a conversation about how to change our system. But the prolific offenders list is about the people who cir circulate in and out of the revolving door of jail. And, and it's a demonstration of how jail doesn't work. Um, and so we're now having a conversation um, about why jail doesn't work and um, the ways that we can um, allow people to talk about, again, the circumstances that led um, to them making a decision to break the law. Yeah. Um, and we are also continuing the conversation that we have been having about making sure that people don't get involved in the criminal justice system mm -hmm. in the yeah. first place yep. by, um, and I know you're going to talk about this more, by yeah, ramping sure. up <laughs> investments of, in programs like LEAD, right. um, the right. program Just Cares, and yes. our other programs that work to uh, intervene before okay. somebody's arrested. Uh, thank you for covering all that ground. I want to make sure that I involve Councilmember Lewis here. Uh, Councilmember Lewis, you were an assistant city attorney before you were a council member. I know you did a lot of work in this arena of diverting low-level offenders here. Uh, what impact do you think this effort by the council is going to have? And when you hear critics say Seattle is creating a culture of lawlessness, things of this nature, how do you respond to that? Well, I think it's important at the front uh, end to stipulate to a couple of really important things. And, and I obviously have a lot of conversations with constituents about this conversation. And the first thing is, Councilmember Herbold pointed out, uh, there is no legislation yet. Uh, so, you know, I'm reserving judgment until we, we see what the final bill is. Um, you know, Councilmember Herbold has laid out a very thoughtful process and we had a great hearing the other day um, where it really is uh, being discussed in the context of um, a lot of similar defenses that exist in other jurisdictions and in the common law. Uh, mm -hmm. The common law defense of necessity is something that is currently available um, to, cons to uh, uh, people that are accused um, in the state of Washington. Uh, and essentially what we're discussing would potentially be a, um, a modification um, that's a little more specific of the necessity law. Uh, another good example I point people to um, uh, is the uh, there's a there's a defense called choice of evils in Colorado that is that is very similar in a lot of respects uh, to what mm -hmm. we're discussing. So you know what we're discussing um, is is fully uh, something within the realm um, of policy that can be considered to provide an affirmative defense um, to a defendant in a court. Uh, a couple of things that that I'm going to continue to engage in on this conversation is uh, you know I do think that typically. Um, when there's an affirmative defense, um, that burden um, typically falls on the defendant to prove an affirmative defense. Yeah. Um, I think that generally that that is a best practice just in terms of the way it works and the role that it is filling in the criminal legal system. Because when I was a prosecutor, um, I had to, to make a case. I had to meet my elements. Uh, and then there are all sorts of affirmative defenses that we currently have um, in the code where it gives a defendant an opportunity to say, okay, but what about this? Mm -hmm. And this, uh, if, if I am able to prove this, it makes my conduct um, lawful or, or not criminal. Um, but they have the burden of proving that. Uh, and I think that uh, you know, it, it's something where in this conversation I'm leaning toward, I would want that to be in the bill, I would want that to be in the defense. 
Uh, I think it's important also um, that it be very uh, narrowly um, prescribed toward uh, meeting an immediate basic need. And I think it gets tough in the context of proving things in a courtroom if that, if that need is so attenuated that it's based on a resale theory. So, I mean, one that's been talked about a lot is, you know, I'm going to steal um, some electronics and then fence them so I can pay rent. Mm -hmm. And of course, rent is a, is a, is a critical need. Yeah. Um, but at that point, I don't know that the immediate need is close in time enough that it, it, it's readily, that, that it can readily be proven in a court mm -hmm. um, relative to an immediate need like hunger uh, or um, or something else that it is an immediate human need that we all face. So uh, those are the ways I'm continuing to engage okay. with this, but I think it's a worthy conversation. I, I yeah. want to remind people too, because calls that I frequently get about this will say things like, so, you know, if someone uh, if someone's poor, they can just walk into my house and they can steal something. And, and I'll say, well, that would be a burglary, uh, which is a felony. So no, that, that doesn't apply. And I think it is important for folks to remember and center because there's been a lot of discussion about this in the media. And, mm -hmm. and sure, it's controversial. There should be discourse on this. But it's important to stay grounded in what this is and what this isn't. We don't have the power to adjudicate felonies in the city of Seattle. Most of the examples I have seen in the news, um, fearful about what this could do are almost all examples of felonious behavior. So I think it's really important to keep it centered that in the city of Seattle, in our municipal court, which is in a lot of ways the people's court, where we adjudicate common issues that, that any of us could commit um, as a misdemeanor, that we center our common humanity on focusing on ways that that is a place of, um, of reconciling with each other, yeah. uh, that that is a place of, uh, of, of restorative based um, justice, mm -hmm. because these are these are small level offenses, typically with not a lot of, of money and controversy, typically mm -hmm. not violent. I mean, not mm -hmm. exclusively, but typically not violent. Right. Um, and we should stipulate to the fact that approaches like the one that we're talking about in Council Member Herbold's committee yeah. could be a part of that ecosystem. Okay. Uh, and that the all of these stories of, uh, you know, people are going to be committing um, extremely violent assaults, or they're mm -hmm. going to be breaking into my house, or they're right. going to be like, those are mostly felonies, stealing your car. Um, those are felonies, wouldn't be covered by this. Mm -hmm. um, so I think okay. that that's just an important thing to stipulate to Thank at the you. front of what we are talking about and what the context yeah. is. And, yeah. and look, we don't have a bill yet. So yeah. let's, yeah. Um, let's wait until that to, to really start digging down into the okay. details of what of what this proposal does or does not do, because it's still very yeah. effective. Uh, thank you very much for that. I want to stick with law enforcement here. And Councilmember Herbold, back to you. An update on what's next for the SPD when it comes to so-called less lethal crowd control weapons. A U.S. District Court judge recently found the city in contempt of its injunction on the use of crowd control weapons by the SPD. I know Black Lives Matter has come back with a series of suggestions here, sanctions such as requiring reports on the use of these weapons while the injunction is in place. I just want to try to get to the bottom line, though. Do you have confidence the SPD is going to use these weapons properly in the future? Or, and how do you ensure that? Some thoughts on this? Well, I mean, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, we have this issue of um, the, uh, the Black Lives Matter and the ACLU filing for sanctions for violating the, the court's injunction against um, their use. Mm -hmm. um, and that is that was an order from the judge. <laughs> yeah. So if they're, if we're having such a dif difficulty in getting uh, the police department to adhere to the requirements from an order of a judge that are actually more expansive than the city council's law, um, we're going to have some challenges getting that mm -hmm. city council law mm -hmm. um, uh, implemented in a way that it's adhered to as well. So um, I'm very eager to find out um, what um, what results from the, the yeah. um, finding of contempt. Yeah. Uh, and we'll be finding out about that on Friday the 17th. Uh, mm -hmm. There may be sanctions. Mm -hmm. um, and the impact of those sanctions uh, might um, have a uh, an impact where um, the result is um, that um, once the council revisits its law, because we also um, have, have have our crowd control weapons mm -hmm. um, ordinance um, uh, um, sort of 
held um, on a temporary restraining order mm -hmm. um, because in a different court um, related to the police department's consent decree, mm -hmm. they have uh, said you can't implement this law yet. Right. So that's a parallel track. But I think what's going on with the um, the the violation of the court's injunction mm -hmm. um, in the Black Lives Matter and the ACLU case are yeah. going to be instructive yeah. um, to what we right. can expect once we revisit our own crowd control ordinance. Okay. Right. And uh, Council Member Lewis, I, and this is one of many ways the city is really trying to, uh, city council is trying to keep very close tabs on the Seattle Police Department this month into next year as well. I, I wanted to talk about this. Uh, we've seen so many officers leave the SPD over the last couple months. I'm trying to figure out in between this court case and between what the council has been trying to do with its budget or whatever else, what do you expect to see with the SPD as we transition into the new year? Well, the representations that we've received from the department is that they're optimistic that they can reach their recruiting goals um, for the coming hiring year. So uh, it is um, definitely uh, something that I would expect that we will see another recruiting class, that yeah. hopefully that class, um, uh, like last year's, will reflect a more diverse, uh, younger um, cohort uh, yeah. uh, with getting more women, more people of color um, into the department with different um, life experience. Uh, and um, potentially different views uh, on the future of policing. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's really important as we go forward, Brian, because uh, we're having all of these different processes next year, working with community mm -hmm. to really evaluate how we get more diverse resources into the field to respond to our ongoing public safety challenges. Mm -hmm. And that that is going to really square the circle. And I think what one of the biggest problems with the department has been, which has been certainty on mission, and mm. certainty on deployment of resources. Yeah. And as we're standing up things like Help One, uh, yes. to have um, a bigger role, uh, as we're potentially uh, working with service providers to stand up um, something like a CAHOOTS model of response, the, the mm -hmm. crisis assistance helping out in the streets from Eugene, Oregon, mm -hmm. uh, that is gonna have, uh, I think, a really positive impact um, ultimately on the morale of the police force because there will be the certainty of, okay. you know, in what cases are we sending the police to respond to things? Yeah. Uh, and I think that it'll get to the core of a lot of community resentment, which is okay. that there's this imbalance between what we, what a lot of people in the community think police should be responding to and mm -hmm. what they are responding to because right. we haven't created those replacement services. Once we can do that, Brian, I think yeah. it's going to do a really, um, uh, it's going to be a really big boon to morale Okay. Uh, for the police and for and for the community, because what we yeah. really need is that certainty, uh, and we need that predictability. Okay. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, okay. I think 2021 is going to be very clarifying uh, for the future of our response services, and, yeah. and I think we're going to get a more well-resourced and more responsive um, uh, system. Okay. I, I have 30 seconds left. Lisa, I wanted to wrap up with you here. A final question heading into 2021. You said on the show a few months ago, the council's relationship with the mayor was as bad as you've ever seen it in your many years of working at City Hall. Now she's not running again. I'm wondering if that dynamic is changing and if more things are going to get done in the city next year. I'm looking forward to next year and trying to get your thoughts. I just want to be clear, though, that there are um, areas of close collaboration too, mm -hmm. um, like the subpoena ordinance that yeah. I've heard in my committee in order to increase uh, accountability um, mm -hmm. over the police department in cases where there have been complaints, um, mm -hmm. and then making sure that the Community Police Commission has a formal role in upcoming SPOG uh, negotiations and right. uh, the new approach to encampment management. Right. Um, right. That said, um, I, I think um, in the upcoming year, I, I think there will be some issues um, where we're hoping uh, for more of that close co collaboration that we might still see more conflict. And there are gonna be other issues where, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe some of the things that the council uh, wants the mayor to do, the, mm -hmm. the mayor will decide to do it. Um, okay. One of the things I've been thinking about recently um, a lot is the fact that in 2018, the council approved funding for an RV safe lot program. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and the uh, executive spent those dollars uh, for a safe lot program for vehicles, but excluded RVs mm -hmm. um, because of the controversy that an RV yeah. uh, safe lot um, program had in mm -hmm. some neighborhoods. Okay. And so maybe that's an, an example of something that the mayor will just decide to move forward and, and do okay. despite the controversy because it's so needed. Okay, thank you both for your input here. That's all the time we have right now. I'm Brian Callan, and we'll see you next time on Council Edition.